Bob, thank you very much for the gracious introduction, and um, it's certainly an honor to um, be a recipient from ASM of the Aldo Leopold Award. I have to start by, again, giving tribute to Aldo Leopold on whose shoulders all of us in conservation biology, especially in North America, stand. Still think that um, the, the most important thing you can ever tell a new conservation biology student is to read his a Sand County Almanac, which is actually still, it's the best introduction and gives the, not only the facts, but the philosophical um, backbone for the field of conservation biology. But Aldo Leopold was also a family man. He had five children, all of them fantastic scientists and conservationists. And his oldest son in the upper right is A. Starker Leopold, who was a professor at Berkeley. And to give you just a little bit of history, I took my very first class in wildlife conservation from um, Starker Leopold. And during my senior year at Berkeley, I took a individualized one credit um, readings and conference class under, under Starker Leopold. And I actually wrote my very first paper on pikas for him. <laughs> so here I am almost 50 years later talking to you about pikas. And he also introduced me to pikas at Bodie. Um, and you'll see how that turns out. Now, I also, as was introduced um, by Bob, this I believe in, the, in a family affair, and I don't think I would be standing up here if it wasn't for my family. So they are all here, my wonderful wife Harriet, my two daughters who are both conservation biologists. Um, as Bob said, my, my daughter Justine will be giving her paper on pumas or mountain lions as you call them on, on Tuesday, the shameless plug. And my other daughter, Rachel, is works, um, does fantastic work on sea turtles and gopher tortoises. I know, she's a herpetologist. She, she went to the dark side, but, but, I, but I still love her. So. <laughs> now, I have to give you a little background on pikas, in case you're uninitiated. There are about 30 species of pikas in the world. Both species that live in North America and about half the species that live in Asia are rock-dwelling pikas, or live, we call them talus dwelling on the left, and about half the species that live in Asia are meadow or steppe burrowing pikas like that. And the environments that they occupy are, are vastly different. Uh, the American pika lives in talus fields like this one in the Sierra Nevada, and the um, plateau pika that I'll be talking about lives on this is a 4,000 meter meadow, a low altitude meadow in the um, Tibetan plateau, and they're very different. So what's, what's really phenomenal, because most pikas are about the same morphology and body shape, is that there are incredibly pronounced differences between the burrowing pikas and the tailless dwelling pikas. Um, the tailless dwelling pikas can be relatively long-lived, um, up to six years old. Actually, a colleague of mine has a nine-year-old animal that she's been following. Whereas the, the burrowing pikas have rel relatively high mortality rates. Most adults don't live past one breeding season. There's a constant low density normally among tailless dwelling pikas versus a fluctuating high density in the burrowing pikas, which will become really important as we go forward. Um, reproduction in tailless dwelling pikas is generally quite restricted. Um, to give you an idea from North American pikas, the American pikas, most, most mother pikas initiate two litters, but only wean one. The average litter size is three, and they normally wean about two young per year. Whereas the meadow dwelling pikas hit, successfully produce many large litters, like three week intervals over the course of the summer. Tailless dwelling pikas are individually territorial. The rock-dwelling pikas in Asia tend to live in pairs, but the males and females still don't have very much to do with each other. Quite asocial. <laughs> you, can, you can actually watch them for like 10 hours and see one social interaction. Whereas the meadow burrowing pikas that I watch up on the Tibetan Plateau, you can see one social interaction per minute. They're like monkeys, and they are incredibly social, living in tightly cohesive family groups. They both have limited dispersal. The settlement patterns of both kinds of pikas is that most animals are either philopatric or live ultimately as adults in a territory next to where they were initially born. The basic mating system tends to be monogamy. This is actually facultatively monogamous um, mating system in 
tailless dwelling picus, simply because males can't defend sufficient resources to control access to multiple females. There are variable mating systems in the burrowing picus, basically monogamy, but because of the high overwinter mortality, there are parts of the meadow that have an abundance of females, and some of the family groups will be comprised of multiple females, and they'll be polygynous, and some of the family burrows will burrow systems will have an abundance of males, and they'll be polyandrous. Um, it's true polyandry, and it's a fascinating story, but I don't have time. Um, only two vocalizations, the short call and the long call given by males, which is a mating call in the rock dwelling pikas, whereas up to six different vocalizations, whines, trills, youngsters yelling, and the fathers rolling across the meadow with them and stuff. So a whole seminar unto itself would be to flesh out what I've been talking about here. Um, but these data actually result from me sitting on rocks or sitting on the meadow for hundreds of hours. Um, and I must confess that, um, pursuant to the last talk, I, I actually lament that fewer and fewer conservation biologists are actually putting in the time to actually know the natural history, ecology, and behavior of the organisms um, in the natural world that they're attempting to conserve. Um, I think that the intuition that you get from knowledge, from doing field work, is really essential to understanding biodiversity and, and how we should engage in, in conservation biology. And I see a little bit of that slipping away. Just to show you some pikas, just for fun, um, there is a diversity. This is the collared pika, the other pika in North America, rock dwelling pika. Here are two rock dwelling pikas found up in the Tibetan Plateau, the Chinese red pika and the glover's pika. Neither of these species have ever been studied. And here's a forest dwelling pika found largely in Sichuan province, Okatona Tibetana, and probably the most famous pika of all, um, my colleague Li Weidong's pika picture of the, of the Ely pika. It's a cute picture, um, but what's most important is that this individual pika was the very first living one that had been seen in, in 20 years. So, and, and that's another whole wonderful conservation story. Well, my goal today, now that you've been introduced to pikas, is to emphasize the need for quality science to serve as the platform for proactive conservation decisions. Certainly, we also need to engage the public, um, local people, policymakers, and ultimately to incorporate political, economic, and sociological themes in our conservation issues. But the bedrock, and what we should all stand for, is the science. Um, and the clear interpretation and unbiased interpretation of science that we, that we bring forward is really essential in terms of having solid conservation, or else we'll lose our credibility with the public. So what I want to do today is introduce two conservation themes. The first beginning with the plateau pika. Um, the plateau pika, to give you a background, the geographic range is almost identical to that of the high altitude Tibetan plateau. Um, the Tibetan plateau occupies 25% of China. It's largely between, occupies 3,000 to 5,000 feet in elevation. It's occupied primarily by pikas pastoralists and their livestock and some of the other native wildlife which lives there. And as I've indicated, the plateau pikas are very social. They may reach densities of up to 300 animals per hectare, maybe 1,000 burrows per hectare. And critically, it's been considered an agricultural pest by policymakers. Now, why should the policymakers consider them a pest and poison these animals indiscriminately? Well, the reasons that are given are that they eat forage that could otherwise be utilized by livestock, that they cause rangeland degradation, they are responsible for increased erosion. Everybody knows that somebody else's livestock or horse stepped in a, in a burrow and basically broke its hoof. Um, and these reasons are nearly identical. We know these reasons, because they're the same reasons we poison prairie dogs in North America. Um, and few of any of these reasons have really been scientifically justified. I mean, just to give you one example, I took a whole series of, of papers from the Chinese ecological literature that, that talked about, in the, that said that pikas were responsible for increased erosion. I literally lined them all up chronologically on a big table and found that this paper cited this paper and this paper cited that paper and went all the way down the daisy chain until the first one, and th these all are declaratively saying this, someone heard a pastoralist say, oh, I think they cause erosion. 
And there was no scientific evidence whatsoever. And this is again being justified for one of the largest poisoning programs um, of any native mammal um, in the world. Now this poisoning has gone on for about five decades. It's massive in scale. It hasn't improved rangeland health. The Chinese literature largely says that the rangelands are becoming increasingly degraded. Well, you've been poisoning the pika for five, for five decades, and the rangelands are getting worse. If it's not working, why keep doing it? But that is not the way things play out. Now, just to show you sort of the magnitude of the poisoning and to give you some flavor, and I'll contrast this with prairie dogs, here's actually a, um, a printout from the China Daily, the official Chinese English language newspaper. The key word is infestations. They call them rats, but they're really pica infestations have been severely threatening the ecological environment. And I guess, oh, pretend for a second that you're actually the superintendent of Yosemite or Yellowstone National Park, that the budget would be equivalent to US $925 million that they would be allocated toward the poisoning of these animals. Now you can actually still Google this environment fund targets rats, just not while I'm talking. <laughs> um, but you'll see, there are other things that that money was spent on, um, things that actually I can tell you you don't want to know about. Um, but that's huge. And we, so this is a press release from an official U.S. Forest Service press release. It was a, an article, again, the word infested with prairie dogs. These are native species in North America. And I, I thought this was really classic because we're, this, this article says, we know they're keystone species, so we're gonna do the right thing. We're gonna increase them from 1% to 2% of their former range. This is like a 98% error rate in my estimation. So we can't cast stones. Um, the most recent evidence I have in the extent of poisoning, um, Huang Hao from Beida, or, um, Beijing University last week told me that he has calculated over the last 10 years, $62 million, has been used to poison at least one third of the pika range in San Zhangyuan National Nature Reserve. This is actually poisoning a native species in a nature reserve. Um, and the poison that's actually being used now is type C botulism um, toxin. Here, you can just buy this on the street. It's a biohazard agent in the States. And it's spread by hand into pika burrows. Just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the poisoning. Now, I take an alternative view. The alternative view, and from a paper that I wrote with one of my graduate students back in 1999, um, called the Pi Plateau Pica a, a keystone species and an ecosystem engineer. And I can run through some of the logic that we used at that particular time and then show you some of the data that we have. Um, Pikas provide the habitat for almost all the endemic species of birds that are found on the Tibetan Plateau. Um, there are no trees at 5,000 meters. The birds normally nest in pica burrows. When you poison the pikas, the burrows collapse and the birds disappear. Um, this is Hume's ground pecker. These are all snow finches. And we have done controlled walks in areas that have been poisoned and non-poisoned, the poisoned areas where the burrows have collapsed. These are all snow finches. The solid black bars show that primarily the snow finches exist on non-poisoned areas and hardly exist at all in poisoned areas. This is Hume's ground pecker, which we found <laughs> These were standardized morning, midday, and afternoon counts of 100 meters doing strip censuses um, in all three river drainages of the, on the, in the Sanjiangyuan National Nature. Sanjiangyuan means three great rivers, the Mekong, the Yangtze, and the, and the Huanghe, the Yellow River. Um, we've had zero cases of Hume's ground pecker on areas that had been poisoned and huge numbers um, on non-poisoned areas. Sort of a nice control is this species, which is the horned lark, um, same species as we have here, they nest on the surface of the meadow, and so they're not affected in this way. The pika serve as the primary food for nearly all of the plateau's predators. Um, from detailed work on each of these species, um, the, the fun, the, actually a funny looking fox, the Tibetan fox, um, about 95% of its diet tends to be plateau pikas, the same for palaces cat, same for weasels, Oh, I guess I have another button to push. Black kites and, and brown bears, up to 90% of the grizzly, what we call grizzly bears are brown bears or as, as the diet of pikas. Um, pikas actually run between the legs of the bears, but the bears dig up enough. And um, NGOs are actually even having to, to raise money to put electric fences around Tibetan houses because the bears, once all the pikas are gone, are now breaking into, into their houses. Um, so all, literally all of the, mammalian and avian predators 
almost exclusively exist, on, again, on the high-density, non-hibernating plateau pica. Pikas also promote increased plant species richness via disturbance. These are some of the wonderful plants that are found up in the plateau, from edelweiss to a species familiar to us, fireweed, and the famous Tibetan blue poppy. Um, Brigitte Hogan, one of my graduate students, sort of my designated botanist who basically crawled around did plant quadra quadrats, showed that, again, the cumulative number of species on areas that had, that had been poisoned is significantly less than areas that had not been poisoned. And there's a Tibetan princess flower, a really pretty poppy. And so we've made some inroads in terms of convincing um, some of the Chinese scientists that um, the plateau picots are certainly worth saving, but not quite enough. So at this stage, we, we took sort of a step back and said, what else is going on here? And one of the things about the Tibetan plateau, it's the, the home of three great rivers, as I indicated earlier. It's been estimated between 15 and 25 percent of the people in the world live in drainages downstream from rivers that originate in the Tibetan Plateau. The Chinese call the Tibetan Plateau their water tower. Well, the shibboleth in, in, Chinese, in the Chinese ecological, ecological literature is picus cause erosion. We thought that we would test that. So doing tightly controlled experiments using a double ring infiltrometer we went to all three river drainages and took um, infiltration measurements um, where the blue bars are fairly close to a pica burrow on a pica colony, the red bars are within a pica colony but away from a burrow, and the green bars are areas where picas had been poisoned and the burrows had collapsed. And you don't need statistics to look at this chart. Um, this is the speed of infiltration. Now, anyone who's ever had a leak in your house, or <laughs> all water has to go somewhere. So during the summer monsoonal rains, if the water doesn't percolate into the soil, it's much more likely to run off, um, cause local erosion, and cumulative, given the massive amount of, of uh, poisoning across the Tibetan Plateau, can even lead to massive loss of life and property downstream in any one of these major rivers. Um, this has actually begun to um, convince some of the policymakers in China. So we're using all of these scientific data um, to forward the cause that poisoning this native species is counterproductive. We've done this on a local scale, um, working with Mark Foggin, um, who organized this a teacher's workshop, um, literally at the end of the road in, in southern Qinghai. I think this guy asked me a question. He said, well, what do you think about pikas? And I love to talk. And, I, <laughs> and I actually didn't. I actually said, well, what kind of life do you want to leave, in future, do you want to leave for your children? And, th and they broke into focus groups. I didn't know that the Tibetan teachers would know what a focus group was. They came back an hour later, and they knew their system. They came up with every single point that I had ever thought of, why you shouldn't poison pikas. And actually, when the government was forcing them to all do the poisoning that I've talked about earlier, this particular township, which has actually covered a huge, massive part of, the, of southern Qinghai, refused to do this. So you can work locally with people. I've also worked with uh, a biodiversity working group of the China Council. People might recognize Bob Hoffman and, or Jeff McNeely. Uh, it's a small group that worked to advise the Chinese government. And more recently, under our CNH grant from NSF, we've been working with local communities. Essentially, we haven't completely cracked the nut. We haven't stopped the poisoning. It's still going on. But I'm very encouraged that well, I, I obviously don't have any way of positively influencing the Chinese political system, but most, I think to the one, every leading conservation scientist that I, that I know in China now adopts this and is actually pushing forward with the, with the logic that the pika is a keystone species and an ecosystem engineer, and I'm optimistic that hopefully we'll be able to turn the corner in such a way that, that we can stop the poisoning, one of the most massive poisoning of an of a endemic species which is really bankrupting, actually, the sustainability of the plateau and its biodiversity. And it costs less to do nothing. And so we hope that this will become a win-win-win situation going forward. The second conservation issue I wish to address is the question about whether or not the American pika is endangered. I don't know how many of you are aware, but our President Barack Obama was speaking in front of Yosemite Fall a week ago on Saturday, and he said, alpine mammals like pikas are being forced further upslope to escape higher temperatures. 
And this is certainly a party line, um, especially among most uh, US NGOs. And I think that we should investigate the extent to which this is actually valid. So there have been several, I guess you call them lawsuits, or findings that have led to the decisions by the state of California, which has the only Endangered Species Act among states, as well as the um, United States Endangered Species Act. And these decisions have determined that the American pika is not endangered. Now, I believe that these are actually solid findings. I don't believe that the pika is endangered, but I think that it's really important here, because I'm arguing in, fact in favor of science, is that we actually investigate some of the reasons why and what's going on. The, I completely admit that there's an amazingly compelling argument as to why pikas might be considered endangered. And a lot of it is from data that I've gathered over the years. Um, pikas have high resting body temperatures. It's only within a few degrees of, of lethality so that they have a really narrow window of, of flexibility in terms of their, their, their personal thermal environment. Individuals, because they're individually territorial on talus, Pikas can't eat the rocks, and so they have to have bigger territories to have access to the meadow vegetation. So they live at low density. Any low density population is more subject to stochastic extinction. Pikas tend to be poor dispersers, so that if populations go extinct, they're less likely to be colonized, and it's because there's a high propensity for filipatry, as I indicated earlier. They have a low reproductive capacity, as I said, Almost every single population of American pikas that's been looked at has a litter size of three, actually a smaller litter size in Alberta. And actually, just to chuck away for five minutes or 10 minutes from now, the Bodhi population is the largest average litter size, statistically larger than, than any other population that's ever been studied. And I'll come back to that. There's also the idea that low snowpack may lead to increased overwinter mortality. So everything sort of conspires against the pika, which makes it very compelling as to why it might become endangered, especially under, under a scenario of global warming. The thing that actually works in the favor of pikas is the fact that they're extremely long-lived. So let's look at pikas and temperature sensitivity first. From work I've done earlier at my low-altitude Bodhi site, um, these are sort of um, black bulb and shade temperatures, when the temperatures are really high, the pikas essentially are inactive. As a biologist, I have to sit there and cook, writing zeros, but the pikas are really smart. They're in the rocks cooling off, um, and we know very well that there's a very much thermal buffering if they get just a meter or two into the rock talus. In the exact same places in May, where it's cooler, the pikas will be active most of the day. At high altitude, where it's cooler, pikas can be active throughout the day. So this is fairly compelling evidence that the, the pikas know what to do, and that they, they tend to be active um, when it suits them best. So there is the scenario that this, this sort of truncation of activity means that they have less time to economically make a living, and I'll come back to that in just a second. Well, actually, I have it here. They, they become nocturnal but I have some data in just one second. So when I had these data, I went and did, we had the Aya Cook explanation last time. Pre-Aya Cook, you could do certain things, and it was actually, I have to preface this, and it was part of the culture of what physiological ecologists did, and my, my mentors were Jim Brown and George Bartholomew, which were, who were physiological ecologists, and so I did the lethality experiment. So, the lethality, and this is actually a data sheet that I found from 1970. The ink was dry in 1970. I thought I would show you that real data exists. Um, I put pikas in a huge cage with a rock, because pikas love to sit on rocks and vegetation. This is from my high altitude set. I put animals in the cage at dawn, monitored the, monitored the temperature, which was not very high. These are shade temperatures. And then at the end of the day, release the animals. When I did this at my low altitude Bodhi, high altitude site, the animals were put in at dawn. Um, by noon, one animal perished when the ambient temperature was 25.5 and another case at 29.4. I did the experiment a third time and there was a cloud cover and I finally released the animal alive at two o'clock in the afternoon. So how is this, as scientists, we can do work and we can publish them, but we can't control what people say about our work, which is actually very distressing at times. 
So this experiment has been misquoted by almost every major environmental NGO in North America. Um, and, and so I, I actually, this is from a major senior scientist of the National Park Service actually testifying before the Senate Subcommittee on National Parks. My Senator McCain and actually Senator Udall were present. This took place in, in um, Rocky Mountain National Park. And he said, because of their warm coats, pikas are unable to tolerate temperatures above 78 degrees for even an hour, period. It doesn't say that it was an experiment. It doesn't say that the pikas could go hide in the rocks and, and cool off, that they were smart enough to do this in real life. Um, here's a quote from the Nature Conservancy magazine. The, the pikas can perish when exposed to prolonged temperatures at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. I wrote the author and told her she should go back to the original literature that I did the experiment. She wrote back and told me to bugger off. So, so this, is, this is sort of part of the narrative of why the pikas were actually um, proposed for endangered species status was this experiment, which has been miscited widely. And the idea that pikas couldn't be active, be, um, could actually not be economically active because they constrain their activity during the middle of the day, negates the fact that they have the opportunity to become nocturnal. Now, I've sat up at night at Bodie and at another low altitude site where I work now in the Mono Craters. We've watched the pikas run around at night and the like. But even high altitude pikas are nocturnal. Ken Hickman, who's one of the, the make some of the nicest looking camera trap pictures, um, has sent me his pictures from last, just last week, Ken sent me this picture. There's a pika sitting on his hay pile at 10:15 p.m. I had pictures from one o'clock in the morning and two o'clock in the morning. Th that was the cutest pika, so I told this. Um, and he actually determined that the pikas, this is at high altitude. I mean, I was, I was standing in front of this hay pile a week ago, except that it was under a snowdrift still. Um, high up on the Virginia Lakes drainage. Um, pikas were nocturnal, nocturnally active 30% of the time, and during the fall, during foraging, up to 39% of the time. And these are even high altitude pikas. So uh, some of our mystifying thing that pikas are exclusively diurnal is because people haven't taken the time to gather the data. Then, I, okay, so I have to plead guilty again. So I'm pleading guilty again for a paper that I wrote in Ecology on comparative demography of pikas back in 1978. Um, I proposed that a lack of insulated snowpack should increase pika mortality during winter. They would be subject to harsh cold temperatures because the snow doesn't provide the insulated layer. They would burn up because they would um, have to thermoregulate too much. And this, this, this fact has been widely adapted, this, this sort of contention has been widely adapted as fact throughout much of the North American pika literature. But we have a test. And the poor people of California that are suffering through this fantastically horrible drought, and the worst year of all was the winter of 2014-2015. In the Sierra Nevada, throughout the intermontane west, in Canada and the United States, the, the classic measurement is water content of snow on the 1st of April. And it actually is the driver for how water management in the west will take place. When they did the measurements, um, in April of 2015, the snow water equivalent was 5% of the historic average. The, the previous low f for like 100 years was like 25% on a really big drought year. There was literally no snow in the Sierra Nevada, and the pikas should have suffered miserably by not having any snow and still be subject to the cold winter temperatures. These are pika hay piles from the summer of 2015. Everywhere I went, there were, so I've shown you hay piles that show old hay piles underneath. These are all hay piles that have been built. Everywhere I went, there were pikas. I have one picture of one of my colleagues, Connie Millar, who's done even more surveying in the Sierra Nevada, sitting in front of a hay pile in front of um, Dunderberg Mountain. Um, the pikas voted, and they rejected my hypothesis. <laughs> and so, um, again, I was convinced I was right, but this, and you don't know that you're going to have a winter like that that comes up, but you have to take advantage of it. And so we're currently trying to figure out how to write this up because the information is sort of ad hoc, but it's, it's very real. So I'd like to get, so talking about warm temperatures and, and pika occupancy, one of the drivers of the, of the lawsuits for um, considering the pikas as endangered 
was that several low altitude populations have been extirpated in the Great Basin. Uh, many of these in the Great Basin I, I can't talk about because I don't know how big they were. Small, medium, and large doesn't cut it for me. But at least there was one paper that was published in, in the California um, patches where there were 67 historical populations that looked at and 10 of them were considered to be extirpated. This is by Stewart, 2015. Um, and his institution uh, issued a press release the moment that this paper was released. And the press release was entitled Shrinking Range of Picus in California is Linked to Climate Change. Um, Talus patch size was only mentioned once in the entire article. Yet I've chosen to talk about this particular graph because it, was, it did the right thing. It talked not, not only about temperatures, but also about talus area. Um, this is a log scale so that these patches down here are really very much smaller than these patches up here. And I have drawn the red line. If you look at the red line, you see that seven of the 10 patches that went extirpated were really tiny patches, significantly tinier than these. Patch area explains much more of the variability, but that didn't constitute any of the narrative that accompanied the paper. If you actually draw, I drew the blue line too. So if you look at the, the, the really warm temperatures here, you see that it's 50-50. But even in the 50-50, the patches that went extinct are all smaller than the patches that are extant. And one of these, I think, is certainly not extant because that is southern Bodie. And you can decide later whether you think that's really an extinction or not. So there's been a, an, an interesting narrative. But let me show you sort of how this plays out in real life. Um, people are now studying pikas at lower and lower altitudes. You don't have to know, I, so I highlighted all the, the low elevation, low elevation, low elevation. There's been this incredibly positive trend that conservation biologists now are realizing that you don't study species at the core of the species range, but if you're gonna understand climate change, you go to the extremities. Let's see what this looks like. Um, Connie Millar, along with um, my daughter Justine and Don Grayson, um, spent some time in Mono County last August. This is a patch just east of Yosemite, there's the Sierra Nevada crest in Yosemite National Park, that's Mono Lake. Here is a black tailless patch. You can see that pikas have been here, that little round droppings, because pikas are lagomorphs, they have round droppings, you can see them. This is a, a look at the patch. Um, this was a patch that was recently occupied by pikas, but we could find no current trends that, that, that there were living pikas there now. This is sort of interesting philosophically to us as conservation biologists, I think. Um, this patch is nowhere near any other talus. It's sitting in the middle of a sagebrush plain. And pikas have lived here for a very, very long time. So that's the cup half full. The cup half empty is that they're not there anymore. So it does represent an extirpation. If you actually walk 50 meters from where I took that picture and look north, you see the Sweetwater Mountains, which is an isolated mountain range. And on that, that isolated mountain range, here is a very small isolated talus patch that has probably been extant for millennia and fresh pica sign everywhere. So pikas are subsisting in some of these really, really crazy low altitude isolated places, which is, which is phenomenal. But because I could go back to Leopold, Starker Leopold, telling me about the Bodhi Pikas, I um, was lucky to begin working there in 1969. There is the Sierra Nevada crest. Actually, the picture of Connie sitting by a take pile was right there. But the Pikas at Bodhi, Bodhi live in these rock tailings, which actually act, act like a natural laboratory. Um, this is now the longest study of any pika population, and it happens, coincidentally, to be at a really low elevation. Um, the pikas live in ore dumps. They make their hay piles near the edge. Sometimes they get confused um, and make their hay pile inside old detritus like that. Um, but the, we have 78 islands that we've been looking at. The Bodhi population is largely a figure eight because there's really sort of a low elevation gap here with some of the mining claims up here and some of the mining claims down here. And I will refer to these as the northern and southern constellations going forward. So at Bodhi, the pikas live off great basin vegetation, sagebrush, bitterbrush, rabbitbrush. 
So it's, it's very difficult to sort of generalize from a generalized herbivore, which sometimes their dietary needs and selectivity is extremely complicated. Ask anyone who sort of deals with this. But let me be as simple as possible. Some of the people that have talked about the pikas going extinct and one of the reasons for the, for the lawsuits um, to, to evaluate them as endangered species is that the high altitude meadows would change dramatically with climate change and the pikas wouldn't have anything to eat. Well, look at what they're eating now. Um, they're eating really rough, coarse vegetation. Um, they don't need alpine vegetation to survive. Oh, and this is a pica sign. You can sit there and sort of ruminate what it takes for a pica to sort of lift their butt high enough to sort of make these little cones of, of scats. <laughs> Just in the sight. So, um, it's warmer at Bodie now than it was because it's an old ghost town, um, but there were miners there in the 1800s. We actually have temperature records on site going back for a very long time. So this shows you the temperature range over about 100 years. It is now warmer at Bodie than it used to be back in the late 1800s. But intense variability. This is the, just the, I showed you just the July average monthly temperatures. You can also look at threshold temperatures as how many days were over 28 degrees or warmer. And yes, we have some 20, large number, 20 days, 28 degrees or over recently, but also in the 1940s and 1960s, while the pikas were doing pretty well when Joy Harold Severide was working with the pikas there, um, also had a large number of days. And it's, and it's sort of to put this in the context of sort of global warming, the IPCC says that like make six degrees Celsius by the turn of the century, uh, would be sort of an expected temperature rise. Uh, Bodhi is currently 8.3 degrees warmer than pikas in that crest of the Sierra Nevada, only 30 kilometers away. If you want to know how pikas survive, you can just study them at Bodhi now. And we have. Pikas are also interesting at Bodhi because they exhibit sort of all the islands are a metapopulation. They actually have difficulty dispersing between patches, but there's a lot of stochastic extinction on patches. Um, We've, Mike Gilpin convinced me to go back after several years, and we started in 1989, um, and have had 18 censuses. We've had sort of an even number of recolonization events and extinctions of populations on patches. But this varies from year to year. Some years there are lots of recolonizations, and some years there are lots of extinctions. Um, so as a balance, which is what you would have in a real true metapopulation um, of the dynamics that are going on um, within the Bodhi system. Now what's interesting is that we have years with large numbers of colonizations and, and, and large years with large numbers of extinctions. We have all the weather data, so we can actually posit, well, gee whiz, maybe the extinctions took place in years that were warmer, and maybe the recolonization years were years that were cooler. But we have all the temperature data. So we've looked at current year's weather data, including both acute and, and, and chronic temperatures, and the previous year's data, and there's, there's zero climate signal for, e for any of those hypotheses. The climate doesn't have anything to do with this pattern, at least in terms of meteorological measurements. But what we do know is that there's been some interesting things going on at Bodhi. Um, over time, from my 1972 and 1977 um, censuses, and then when we began again in 1989, is that there are fewer patches occupied. But this is not random. What has happened is that the southern constellation in my figure eight has gone extinct. And this is actually one of the X's on Stewart's graph as an extinction. But the northern patches show no difference at all. Um, if you actually look at the data from 2009, 83.8% of the patches in the northern constellation were occupied. And in 1972, it was 83.3%. There are actually more pikas alive in the northern constellation in 2009 than in 1972, in spite of the fact that the temperatures have been going up. So you can't really, to me, you can't say that the, that the pikas one kilometer south in the southern constellation went extinct because it was too hot, when the northern constellation is doing just fine. So it doesn't seem to be a temperature signal, um, and I think that we can learn from that. Now, I stopped working at Bodhi in 2010. I've even gone to a more extreme area. This is the Mono Craters, which is about 20 kilometers south of the Bodhi site. 
Um, this is like watching pikas on the moon. I'd love to talk more about this, but I don't have time. I can tell you that the pikas didn't read any of the pika literature. They, their, their vocalization rates are about the same, and everything else is off the charts. We, they're like ghost pikas, except that this isolated, the Mono Craters, a really young mountain range, um, hardly any vegetation. The pikas have been surviving there for probably millennia. And this, there's a, there are eight pikas along this stretch, and we have done, now done complete behavioral observations on them um, and have a paper coming out. So the, a summary for the American pikas is that the pikas seem to be far more resilient than we thought. Um, we see that there are additional low altitude populations that are being discovered. Um, we see that pikas can adjust their activity um, to temperature conditions, including engaging in nocturnal activity. They can adjust to whatever local vegetation is available. Anybody here who's a reproductive physiologist know that how, much, how much energy expenditure it is for a, for a small mammal to, to reproduce and to produce large litters. Bodhi, which if you think that the temperatures are really stressful, has statistically the highest litter size of any pika population that has ever been studied. Does this mean that they're stressed? I don't think so. Um, and so, so these all, things all show a, a large degree what the resiliency is of pika populations in North America. Now, on the other hand, I gave a space there, patch size and distance to other occupied patches, sort of the metapopulation dynamics, becomes really important in the persistence of pikas. The southern population may have gone extinct for some kind of reason of metapopulation collapse, but the truth is it's still only one or one and a half kilometers from active pika populations that have not been able to successfully disperse south. That maybe the warming temperatures are inhibiting that degree of dispersal. That means that if you go into the Great Basin or some of these other isolated patches, such as some of the X's that might have been on, on, on the Stewart graph, is that those populations, once they're extinct, they're gone. And there's no coming back because we're not going to get recurrent colonization. And the data seem to be fairly clear. So the pikas are in sort of a general decline. They're certainly not increasing, but they're also incredibly more resilient than we thought they were. Um, and so that's sort of the status of the American pika. They don't seem to be going extinct, but they still certainly can tell us a lot about what is happening at the edge of a species range. So in summary, Conservation biology and action are really only as strong as the scientific data that we can bring to the table. I never thought in my career that I would become an eco-hydrologist. I had no training in this. I, I, I brought really talented graduate students on to help me. Um, but the eco-hydrology aspect of working with the plateau pica may be the final, most important piece of evidence we have to convince policymakers to stop that egregious poisoning um, throughout the Tibetan plateau. And we can already see the positive shift of biologists to study American pikas near the edge of their species range. That's where the action is. Historically, behavioral ecologists, we always went to the core of the species range. It's easier. And I can tell you it's a lot more comforting to sort of sit in a high alpine meadow and watch pikas than to sit and cook at Bodhi or at the Mono Craters. But we have to change our ways um, because the questions that we have are what are happening at the edge of these species ranges. And that's where we need to understand the dynamics of change even more because of what is happening with global warming. Ultimately, these attempts will allow us to best preserve our wondrous natural environment and uh, world, and that's the world that we all cherish. Thank you very much. Okay. We do have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. You mentioned that pika populations seem to be healthy, but yeah. what about fecundity? Do you have any data for No. Or Wouldn't it be nice if you knew what the weather would be the next year? <laughs> but we didn't. So, I, so we don't have a d data on, on fecundity. And, and that's a great question. I mean, we have to acknowledge that when we're, when we're writing this up. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, let me get back. But, but one of the things that's, again, a saving grace for these animals is that they're so long-lived that if they survive, they can reproduce the next year and the next year. And so that really, th th that's the one buffer that they, that they have. Yeah. And if you will repeat uh, the question. Okay. Okay. 
Right. Um, the question, actually, that was a statement. Is it a question? Yeah, there is that, so how do you square that with what we see now? Okay. I can, I can say that Don Grayson wishes... Okay, the question was what, over the Holocene, there has been this gradual up, upslope retraction of pikas, and that's true. Um, I can tell you that Don Grayson wishes he could take the paper back from his own words. Um, the thing, yes, pikas have been found, if you, if you go back to Jim Brown's mountain, Mammals on Mountaintops paper, pikas were found on, on most of the islands in the Great Basin and are now only found on a small number of islands. So this is a fairly recurrent pattern that, that in the Great Basin, mammals in general have lost diversity in mount, and so that's a long-term trend, and that's undeniable. Um, but whether we're getting sort of that action within the score of decades right now is the question um, with regard to global warming. And that's where I, I, I think I can paraphrase Don because he told me in person that he says he wished he, he hadn't quite extrapolated that to the degree that he did. He's writing a paper right now to recount that. 